1966 Ford Mustang. A steel chariot built with weapons-grade nostalgia. A whiff of that oily, vinyl, metal aroma. And it's Saturday night. You're dating your sister's friend, Rochelle, and feeding coins into the arcade machines, remarking how between burger time and beer tapper, all they need is a french fry arcade game to make a full meal. You take her back to your 1966 Mustang you got from your older cousin. You know, the one who was born a full 20 years before you, so he's really more like a weird, leathery-skinned uncle in dust-colored dungarees. But he's also still kinda with it, culturally. So you let him give you tips about how to finger blast your date in the hopes of getting the chance to bump unfortunates in the back of the car he's lending you. And the date is going great, except that Rochelle doesn't believe in books, so it's not like there's any kind of real conversation going on here. And if there is, she's invariably going to mispronounce something that drives you up a damn wall, like Reese's Pieces. She's like Rapunzel, except instead of letting down her hair, she lets down the English language. But at least you still have a sick ride she won't throw up in because you were too broke to buy her any drinks because you're 19 and YouTube hasn't been invented yet. 1966 Ford Mustang. So yeah that opposite day Iacocca wanted the Mustang to evoke a touch of nostalgia but see that's the thing the Mustang would never evoke true nostalgia because even in its own time it was never really a modern car it was always retro and nostalgia is generally characterized by distance from the modern you can't be nostalgic for the past if that past never existed Hell, the Falcon is more of a futuristic design than the Mustang, but, you know, no one ever really talks about that. The only Mustang that really looked futuristic was the Fox Body Mustang, and, you know, it's not really like Ford decided to stick with that design. Before long, they went for this sort of middle ground between modernity and retro styling, without really putting an eye towards the futuristic look, except for the more modern Mustang, which looks angry all the time. But I guess that's neither here nor there. You see... I like Mustangs. People know this about me, and yet, it's hard to always get enthused about every Mustang that crosses your path, even one from the era of its genesis. In its time, the Mustang was a youthful car, but today, it's almost like people assume the average vintage Mustang driver is just a woolly willy without the magnetic filings. And that's not really the case, since people of all ages are still interested in these cars of the 1960s, particularly ones of this eternally retro styling. And hey, I would be lying if I said I wasn't itching at the opportunity to sit my ass in a 66 Mustang myself, if for no other reason than to see if it really deserved some of the bigger criticisms it received in its day. Because for all the talk of the Mustang being the popular innovation that brought Ford into the baby boomer generation by essentially being the one corporate product to mostly survive the anti-establishment leanings of the counterculture, the fact of the matter is that automotive publications of the time really weren't crazy about the Mustang. Case in point, Motor Trend ragged on the Mustang from a design standpoint, noting that while the car could fit five passengers, the 66 model would leave the fifth passenger practically sitting on top of the other passengers. This is to say nothing of complaints about the uncomfortable proximity of the steering wheel to the driver's chest, the relatively uninspired suspension, and the feeling that while the styling was unique for its time, the Mustang wasn't appreciably different from any number of cars rolling off the line in Dearborn. This was basically the issue Road and Track had at the time, stating that the car doesn't do anything all that surprising. Going from 0 to 60 in 9 seconds is almost expected when you're upgrading from a 260 cubic inch engine, which had a 0 to 60 time of 11.2 seconds, to the 289 cubic inch engine. And that's more or less what we have here in front of us, as Ted offered us a 1966 Mustang running on the 289 cubic inch 4 barrel mid-range V8 with a Windsor block making 225 horsepower at 4200 RPM and 305 pound-feet of torque at 3200 RPM. Now, I didn't research any of those contemporary reviews of the 66 Mustang before driving it, but having taken her out on the road, I can see where the critics were coming from. For a car that Lee Iacocca championed as an option for sports car buffs, it has somewhat stunted handling, like a dog on a leash wanting you to just let it loose to do dog things. It's got style and a certain amount of devil-may-care classiness, but this isn't the same as being on par with the European sports and touring cars that were steadily gaining in worldwide recognition. I think if you asked a lot of people at the time, they would have just bought the coupe because, hey, it's the same as the Fastback. But everyone wants the Fastback because it has the word fast in it. And back, which reminds them of the one time they did anal, but his then-girlfriend said, Ow, stop! Ow, stop! Ow, stop! 
So he did. But when he retells the story at Pappy O' Tappy's, she's gushing like a wrung out chamois. Because some people like their tails to be as tall as their gears. And yet, the differences are kind of what make the Mustang what it is. Quick ratio steering averaging three and a half turns from lock to lock, as well as disc brakes in front and drums in the rear. Is it anything revolutionary? Well, not really. I mean, this is more or less what you'd expect from a car positioned as a sporty option for the American market. But when you think about the excesses that characterized Ford in the mid-20th century, leading to disasters like the Edsel, it's kind of miraculous that they didn't push their luck by going overboard with the design of the Mustang, both under the hood and in its aesthetic. <laughs> Sure, this just has the pony interior, which was more or less the standard, with the silver blue metallic color and the light blue crinkle vinyl and blue rosette vinyl trims. But in much the same way a guy like Gordon Ramsay is always going on about how simplicity is the key to a winning menu, there's something timeless to this design, even if it's visually unexciting. My issues are less about the appearance and more about the placement of certain instruments which just feel counterintuitive to modern sensibilities. But then, you chose a Mustang as much for the price point as anything else, as this was the closest most Americans were ever going to get to a European sports car, even if you could make the argument that this wasn't even really in the same realm. The 1966 hardtop model started at $2,416, while the convertible hovered around $2,700, which puts this in the vicinity of around $18,500 today. So even while there were some quirks about the Mustang, and maybe some design choices that didn't really track with a certain, more traditionalist segment of the market, it was still a hit. And it makes plenty of sense why. But on the subject of those aforementioned quirks, there are mostly just minor oddities. But I could also imagine how some of these would really annoy some people. For one, the hazard lights are in the glove box, which I suppose isn't that big an issue since if you have to put them on, you're probably pulled over anyway. And it's not like hazard lights were even standard yet anyway, so the Mustang was somewhat ahead of the curve on this. But what is strange, and did take a hot minute to get accustomed to, was the high beam dimmer switch being on the floor, since it felt almost like a clutch pedal. Also, from what Ted tells me, the gas cap is an absolute pain in the ass, since the hoop that holds it in place leaves the cap knocking against the chrome bumper. So Ted uses a paper towel to create a cushion for the cap, which is a clever fix, but one that shouldn't have been allowed to become an issue in the first place, even as minor as that issue may be. As for the driving experience, again, it's not really anything you're not expecting. It starts off in second, and the power steering pulls to the right. Acceleration is solid for its time, although you have to keep an eye out on deceleration since below 25 miles per hour, the car shifts to low mode, which puts a pretty big load on the transmission if you then pick speed back up above 30 miles per hour without shifting out of low mode. You see, this car runs on the cruise-o-matic transmission that was pretty much the first automatic transmission to gain widespread use by Ford Motor Company. And while it's fairly straightforward, it might feel a bit strange to modern sensibilities. Okay, so the shifter. The green dot is normal drive position, where the car starts in low mode and then shifts to second and then high. That's for your standard daily driving. Nothing special here. Drive is the tiny dot, and that's for slippery roads, with the car starting in second and shifting to high. The L is for low, which starts the car in low gear and keeps it there for sustained pulling power. You know, I'm making air quotes right here. It also helps the car to brake on hilly roads, so it offers a bit of variety in your driving experience, even if that still doesn't necessarily make the experience exciting. But while it's nothing I'd write home about, it's nothing I'd pitch a fit over either. It's a perfect, middle-of-the-road experience. But then, experiences are subjective. For the most part, life is one big trial by ordeal, where worth is determined by what you can stand. For some people, a Mustang is a thrill ride, and for others, it's an absolute bore. I mean, you ever read that short story, The Lady or the Tiger? Okay, just bear with me here. Basically, there's a guy who's accused of a crime in this kingdom, so the king subjects him to a trial by ordeal by making him choose between two doors. Behind one door is a lady that the king has chosen as an arranged bride for the accused. Behind the second door is a hungry tiger. Now, the king doesn't know that this accused guy has been getting it on with his daughter, the princess. 
Now, since she's the princess, she's able to figure out that the lady the king has chosen for her love is someone she absolutely hates. She's also learned which door the lady is behind and which door the tiger is behind. So on the day her lover has to choose, he looks to her for help in choosing which door to open. She indicates one of the doors, but the story ends before we find out what was behind it. We're meant to wonder if the princess directed him to open the door that would lead to her love marrying a woman she hates even though it hurts, or if she directed him to open a door that would lead to his death, preferring that he die than suffer watching him be with somebody else. We don't know if the accused chose the lady or the tiger, and it's the ambiguity that's key. And I suppose it's sort of the same way with the Mustang. There's ambiguity to the Mustang experience because it's sort of an ambiguous car. It presents itself as a nostalgic, sporty alternative to the tired daily drivers of the era, but it's not nearly sporty or nostalgic or retro enough. And yet, its price point and visual flair make up the difference. You can mod these things to the ends of the earth, but as with any car, it shouldn't take a ton of mods to sell you on it. If you don't love it at the base level, it's hard to imagine you'll love it when it's fat with aftermarket excess. No car presents a uniform experience across eras, but I feel like you mostly know what you're going to get with a Mustang. And this model left me feeling more or less the same way. If I'm the princess, I'm guiding this Mustang to the door with the lady. Because while these things might not be perfect, they deserve to live on with someone new. Pull away the shotgun, bar me a clock, drive a Mustang to the funky weed spot, tried to jack me but the homie got shot, la 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 la.